you. Um, our mission is to improve the quality, safety, and feasibility of cell and gene manufacturing in Canada through optimal manufacturing practices. So we have four business pillars that we everything falls under. I dropped it because uh, I wasn't. I think you have to unmute. <laughs> Sorry, could you? Okay, great. Um, first of is building a strong Canadian network. So. Uh, that centers around sharing best practices and creating a common quality standards across the country. We want to increase collaboration across Canada and break down silos between the manufacturing centers. Under advancing regulatory standards, we work with Health Canada frequently on consulting on regulatory modernization uh, that's taking place in Canada right now. So we want to increase legitimate authorized clinical trials and therapies while denouncing unproven fee-for-service treatments. Under generating effective outreach, we have training programs that we offer. We also have partnerships and webinars like you're joining right now, so thanks. Uh, we want to get the message out. And finally, overall, through all of these things, we want to position Canada as a world leader in the cell and gene therapy manufacturing with a focus on quality, safety, and efficacy. Uh, so we have a few upcoming webinars. Thanks for joining now. If you're still interested, we have some in February and March on uh, clinical trial applications, uh, focusing on the NSNRO, and also on bioprinting. So if you're not already regis registered, check out our website for those. And we recently held a GMP workshop, which was a hands-on workshop here at the CETC in Montreal. We got excellent feedback, so we're going to have more additions to follow. To keep updated on that, uh, be sure to check out our website. Uh, this, the requests definitely drive how much we can offer this, so even though we don't have any scheduled right now, feel free to sign up so we can get those offers out. We also have a supply chain and logistics seminar starting. Uh, it's happening on Monday. So it's too late to register to go now in person, but you can join online, just like you're doing right now. Uh, so check that out at the link. And that's in collaboration with CCRM. Uh, the Cell Therapy Stakeholders Group meets twice a year with Health Canada to discuss regulatory issues. Uh, so if you need any clarification on pressing matters, on regulatory things, uh, then you can feel free to contact us if you have regulatory concerns um, or if you're interested in finding out how you can contribute to consultations around getting cell and gene therapies to the clinic, also let us know. We'll be heading to Paris for the ISCT. The abstract deadline is tomorrow, so if you haven't already gotten your abstracts in, try to do that now. Our collaborator Somia is hosting the is chairing the main plenary on MSCs, and there will be special discounts on student registration and accommodations. And due to popular demand, we're bringing back the strategic forum on the cell and gene therapy rev revolution. That'll be in Ottawa in 2021. So that's all I have to say about CellCan and our upcoming events. With that, I will hand it over to Jason Weiss. So I'll give him a minute to get the screen sharing up and also unmute himself. Oh, he's good. Okay, well, thanks very much, Leah. Hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Um, yep. Perfect. Excellent. All right. Well, firstly, thank you very much to Selkan uh, for this great opportunity to speak with the research community today and talk to you about uh, our research, our core blood for research program, uh, as well as uh, another new initiative that we sort of recently launched, which is, which is that uh, we offer our clinical core blood units uh, to support clinical trials. So I am the business development manager um, for the STEM cells program, and my team and I, uh, we sort of monitor and manage the business intelligence of the STEM cells program within CBS. Uh, we assist with informing on the program's performance and growth strategies, and we do this through data analytics, so both monthly, quarterly, and annual performance reporting. 
uh, through stakeholder engagement. So uh, we organize committee meetings with various SMEs and medical advisors, as well as through environmental scanning as well. So we liaise with other registries and core blood banks um, just to get an understanding of the trends and direction our industry is taking, both uh, nationally and, and worldwide. And of course, also uh, one of the things that my team and I manage is, is the research arm within the stem cells program as well. What I'll talk to you about today. So just briefly here, uh, the outline of my presentation, uh, I'll give a brief overview of, of Canadian blood services, uh, and then I'll talk a little bit more in depth about um, one of the main pillars of CBS, which is the stem cells program. Uh, also give sort of a high level overview of, of what stem cells are and how they're acquired, how they're utilized for therapy. And uh, then I'll talk more in depth about our stem cells, or sorry, our core blood for research program. And the other new initiative, which is the supporting clinical trials. So, um, contrary to what was probably once popular belief, and I know I made this mistake before I came on board with CBS, is, is we're not actually affiliated with the Canadian Red Cross. But we're actually a, a non for profit charitable organization uh, that was created and founded back in 1988 at the height of the contaminated blood crisis. We are regulated by Health Canada as a biologic manufacturer, and we're primarily funded by both provincial and territory ministries of health. Um, and we're, we operate sort of in a national scope and infrastructure and governance that make us quite unique within the healthcare system. We ensure that Canadian patients have reliable access to safe, high quality products related to a broad range of activities in sort of four main areas. And those are listed here, a blood product, so red blood cells, platelets. Uh, we also do this through plasma. And uh, what I'll talk to you about a little bit more here is stem cells. So this is done through the development of the adult stem cell registry, uh, the core blood bank, as well as the autologous program as well. And of course, last but not least, uh, the organ transplant registry as well, for both interprovincial organ sharing uh, related programs in all provinces and territories. So in order for all this to be uh, a viable uh, service, we're supported by uh, greater than 4,000 uh, employees. And we have a full complement of business units and function areas within our organization um, to support us as a biologic manufacturer. Some of those include quality assurance, IT, marketing, communications, just to name a few. So now I'll just talk a little bit more in depth about the stem cells program and, and sort of give a high level overview of, of stem cells and in particular the hematopoietic stem cells. Stem cells program provides uh, really a high quality stem cell product to meet patients needs across Canada and also internationally as well uh, to treat a variety of, of diseases and genetic disorders. Um, and this is done by providing services for um, genetic typing, donor recipient matching, uh, facilitating the stem cell donation, and provision of both frozen cord blood units as well as the autologous stem cell products. So essentially, uh, to boil it all down, our stem cell program really consists of, of uh, three major uh, pillars, such as the autologous stem cell manufacturing process, the uh, adult stem cell registry, the core blood bank, and to a lesser extent, but still important, uh, the core blood for research program as well. Uh, I'll, I'll sort of dive into to all those uh, in a little bit more high level uh, in subsequent slides here. So how are stem cells collected? Well, uh, traditionally speaking, stem cells were collected uh, through the bone marrow, uh, but this is quite an invasive procedure. And as technology has improved, uh, and so as a, a safety profiles, uh, a more common practice now is acquiring stem cells through a process called leucopheresis shown there in, in the middle image. So the, the donor is, is treated with uh, certain, certain types of drugs that will allow the stem cells overproduction of, within the bone marrow of these uh, hematopoietic stem cells. So then the, these will sort of spill out into the blood system. We, we capture them through leucopheresis, filter them out, and, and the rest of the blood products get put back into the patient. These hematopoietic stem cells are un, undifferentiated and they can develop into the three main types of cells that are found in the blood, uh, red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Uh, another uh, very common and rich source of uh, these stem cells is through the collection of umbilical core blood. And that, that's sort of how our, uh, we, we 
valves are, are uh, poor blood bank. And, and so these are, although they're rich in, in these types of stem cells, um, they, the, the amount and the volume that it can be obtained is, is not as substantial as it would be from an adult donor. And so um, the niche sort of for core blood is, is really with pediatrics, but uh, we also, they're also really good for realization of a potential patient that would normally have a, a difficulty finding a genetic match for a, an unrelated donor. Why, why, are, why are stem cells important? Why is this a main focus within CBS? Well, simply put, they save lives. Uh, they're, they've been proven to show efficacy in treating uh, a variety, over 80 different uh, diseases and conditions, both within pediatrics and, and adults. Uh, and just a few examples are leukemia, lymphoma, aplastic anemia, uh, just to name a few. So I've been throwing around the terms autologous allogeneic. What exactly does that mean? Well, uh, autologous stem cells uh, are essentially stem cells that are acquired from the patient's own body. So they are, uh, it's through a procedure in which we remove uh, these stem cells from them, from the patients, we store them, and we give, later give them back uh, for, for treatment um, for, for, for therapy. Allogeneic is uh, basically a procedure very similar to autologous, but they're acquired from an unrelated um, or um, yeah, an unrelated donor, and they're they're transplanted into the patient um, to suppress the disease or restore the patient's immune system. And so, in order to facilitate stem cell treatment via autologous, uh, the Adult Stem Cell Registry was created. And this was established back in 1988 and was originally called the Unrelated Bone Marrow Donor Registry. Um, this registry then received uh, the World Marrow Donor Association WMDA accreditation. And WMDA is essentially an international organization that promotes global collaboration and best practices for the benefit of stem cell donors and transplant patients. So to have this accreditation, uh, it really speaks to the standards and regulations uh, that we follow. Uh, and more than 10 years ago, we were uh, rebranded and we were called the One Map Stem Cell and Boner, uh, Marrow Network. And then just recently, uh, as it currently stands now, we were rebranded again and we're called the Canadian Blood Services Stem Cell Registry. So we uh, primarily focus on recruiting um, young adults between the ages of 17 and 35, and in particular, uh, just due to greater um, clinical outcomes, we, the focus has been on males. Um, and then that's not to say we discriminate. Uh, as long as you are between the ages of 17 and 35 and you're willing to, to get on a registry, we're happy to, to bring you on board. Um, the recruitment method, so there's three main types. Uh, there is you register online and then we'll send you a buckle swab kit for your genetic typing. Um, you can call us up and uh, we can send you a kit as, long, as well as with the application form. Or you could uh, register via an event. So these are usually either run by CBS, patient-led, um, uh, or, or campaign for, for patients, either from their family or from uh, third-party affiliates as well. And so to date, we have nearly half a million volunteer donors that are searchable on the registry on behalf of many patients in need of this type of therapy. And this is both within Canada and worldwide. So at this point, I would be remiss if I didn't say that if you are listening to uh, my talk currently and you are you do fall within that age demographic, uh, please do register to be on the stem cell donor uh, because despite the large size, both within Canada and internationally, there are still many patients that are actively seeking a, a, a match for their uh, treatment. So just a few uh, high-level stats here. Um, the registry uh, from for a year to date for this fiscal year, we have uh, 822 unrelated donor searches for Canadian patients. Uh, we have 330 stem cell transplants that have been facilitated by both Canadian international donors. And we've had uh, over 100 stem cell donations by CBS registrants at our Canadian um, uh, centers. 40 of which have been used to treat uh, Canadian patients. 
But you can see there are still a lot of patients, both within Canada and worldwide, that uh, are still actively seeking stem cell donation. And so another avenue for which we can treat these patients is through our, um, our core blood donation and, and treatment. So um, our business case was developed back in 2007 to, to bring in this infrastructure within CBS. We obtained funding in 2011, and then operations began. Uh, our doors were open in, in 2013, where we started to actively recruit uh, mothers to consent to collect their core blood. We received the American Association of Blood Banks accreditation back in 2015, and later, uh, just this past year, we got our net cash back accreditation as well. Um, again, just talking about the collection process just to give a lot of context here. Um, we have four main strategically placed uh, collection centers for core blood uh, throughout Canada. Uh, we have our facility here in Ottawa through the Ottawa Hospital, a Brampton location at the William Osler Hospital, and then over on the West Coast, we have Edmonton at the Lowe's Hole and uh, BC Women's Center as well. Um, so to date, we've collected nearly 34,000 units from mothers willing to donate their core blood, and uh, we've banked, managed to bank uh, nearly 3,500 units, and uh, about 300 of those are actually still in process uh, going through our system before they are able to uh, actually officially be listed in our bank. And we're still meeting our target for both ethnic diversity within our core blood inventory, which is great, which is 60% non-Caucasian, 40% Caucasian, and this is reflected just in order to meet the demand both within Canada and internationally. And to date, we've actually distributed uh, 25 units, uh, nine of which have been uh, utilized for Canadian patients, predominantly in, in pediatrics. Um, so like anything uh, that deals with biologic manufacturing, uh, we have pretty extensive accreditation and we do follow strict standards and regulations. Uh, a lot of those are sort of outlined by Canadian Standards Association, Health Canada, as well as what I mentioned previously, which is through the AABB and NetCord Net FACT accreditation. So I, I, I'm sure you can appreciate our, our bank uh, and our, our system is in constant the undergoing both internal and external audits in order to make sure that we are upholding these standards and regulations. So I mentioned uh, that the business development unit, my team, one of the aspects that we do to help inform on the program performance is through environmental scanning. And so this is a, an important chart for us. That's something that we, we closely monitor. And this is data that was obtained from the World Marrow Donor Association 2018 annual report. And so if we're looking here at the graph A, um, we're looking at the two main sources of stem cells and their utilization for the patients. And you can see they're steadily on the rise. You have our autologous in red and our allogeneic uh, in blue. So again, allogeneic are stem cells from an alternative source, not from the patient's cells, but through a related or unrelated donor, or the autologous comes from the patient's own um, and then if we focus in and zoom in on the blue graph there, uh, or sorry, rather the blue line, we look at the four main sources for allogeneic stem cell treatments. We have our, in the red there, this is, so we're looking at graph B, our unrelated, uh, which it seems to be plateauing, but it's the most uh, frequently used method for treating patients that require stem cell transplant, and that's where our stem cell registry comes into play. We have our uh, HLA identical siblings. So this is the ideal match, uh, genetically speaking. So if you're a patient and you have a sibling, which really there's only about 25% chance that you would have a match, uh, that's your best possible outcome for at least preventing uh, graft versus host disease. And then you have uh, haploidentical. So this is something in the orange that um, we're monitoring. It's closely on the rise and it's uh, basically just due to our, our increasing our knowledge of, of the technology, of safety profiles, this source comes from uh, either a sibling, a parent, or uh, a child, whereby they're only a half identical match. Again, this is more and more feasible just due to our, our increased safety profile here in the clinic. And, but last but not least, uh, and which pertains to my talk here, is the core blood bank in, in 
or rather the core blood shown in the green there. And you can see that in, in about 2008 up to about 2012, uh, it really sort of peaked and it's been slowly dropping a little bit and, and seems to be leveling off here. So because core blood uh, usage has been steadily um, sort of plateauing a little bit and, and, and is probably the least utilized method to treat patients that require a stem cell transplant, and also due to our high standards for which we want to consider a bankable unit in order to get the best possible clinical outcome. Uh, most of the core blood that's collected is, is either discarded or remains unutilized. And so this was a primary reason for why the core blood research program was developed, as well as why we now uh, are happy to offer bank units for clinical trials to sort of broaden the core blood usage. So of course, the, the main objective of the core blood bank is still to collect and bank core blood for therapeutic use. That, that hasn't changed. But like I just mentioned, uh, again, primarily due to our high standards for what we consider a bankable unit, a lot of it, 75, 80% is, is not considered bankable. And so the Core Blood for Research program was established to help facilitate some of this loss and, and, and put it back into both the Canadian International Biomedical Research Community because these, these are a, a great commodity and can serve a great purpose within, um, within stem cells. Or sorry, within uh, within the research community. Sorry, so it was established um, back in just after a year, or a year after the the, the core blood bank was uh, was in operation, and uh, it's actually jointly was des jointly designed and developed uh, by another uh, branch within CBS called the Center for Innovation. And the Center for Innovation they primarily deal with uh, research initiatives outside of stem cells programs, so primarily with uh, with blood products. And they also manage and, and sort of help regulate the CBS's REB as well. And so the research program, when we first started, we primarily distributed fresh units. Uh, but as of, I think, three years ago, we now do also offer frozen units to researchers as well, as long as they're affiliated with uh, both the academic, government, or, or private sector. So um, some non-qualifying CBUs, um, I do actually remain at one of the three partner hospital sites, the collection sites that I mentioned earlier, uh, Brampton, Edmonton, Vancouver. So that's just a portion of them. Uh, and so they actually uh, go to the researchers affiliated with those hospitals. But a, a lot of them still do come to our facility for distribution uh, to, to the broader research community. And all other non-qualifying CBUs from the other hospital sites um, if they're not bankable, they go to, to uh, into, through our core blood research program. So to date, we've had um, nearly 7,000 mothers consent to donate through this initiative. And we've actually distributed more than 1,000 uh, core blood units to the research community. And just recently, I think as of last year, we all, before as of last year, it was really only the mothers that we wanted to donate. Uh, through the Ottawa Hospital, but now just recently, um, all other mothers that are collected from the other three sites can donate or, or consent to donate for for, uh, for this program. So, if you're a researcher you're listening and you would like to donate, what's the first step? How do you go about this process? It's a great question. Well, I would recommend first starting uh, going to our website at blood.ca and following the links to get to this page here. Uh, where you can not only obtain the application process, but there's also some, some good reading material here. Some of it is actually required in order for this process to proceed through the reviewing sections. Uh, there's also a primer, uh, which is intended to be sort of a guide in understanding the current uh, Canadian context for core blood donation, the role that CBS has uh, for banking, the procurement process as well, um, and the different organizations that are involved in policy setting and governance. Um, there's also a permission to collect form that we provide to the potentially uh, consenting mothers, which is important for the researchers to get an understanding of that as well. So once you've acquired the application, you filled it out in its entirety. Uh, the, the process then follows as, as, 
that's depicted here. So email your application to researchcoreblood.ca. This will then undergo an initial, initial review process. This was initially uh, done so by our director, uh, but we're in the process of streamlining this, this review process in order to get it out the door and approved as quickly as possible so that we can start to um, send these units to the researchers. And so right now, this pre-approval process is done by myself. Um, once it's pre-approved, the, there, I should say, I should mention that there's a scoring system within the pre-approval process, and this helps with our distribution algorithm. And it's primarily based on um, uh, where you're affiliated, the, the likelihood that this could benefit the cellular therapy or the core blood banking uh, system. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in subsequent slides. But you'll get notified that it's been pre-approved and now it's going through both uh, an internal business review as well as it will be submitted to our CBS Research Ethics Board as well. In parallel to that, we will try to uh, send you our material transfer agreement for execution. And this sort of just outlines uh, the terms and conditions for utilizing our core blood units. Once it receives final REU, REB approval, uh, as well as the business approval, uh, we then send it to our director for final approval, um, just to make sure everything is in line uh, and that it's in line with CBS's mandate. We then notify the researcher and um, we can start to um, provide you with, with units when they're available. And this is done from the researcher. So once approved, the researcher will then submit their application on a weekly basis uh, at the beginning of the week. And uh, again, based on our distribution algorithm and as the units are available, we can distribute them in sort of the hierarchy order. So we are in the process of changing our application form so that it is more standardized throughout CBS. And the new form will actually address this question. But until then, we do have to, and this will probably be done in the initial excuse me, review process, um, ask you to sort of populate within the application and address this question here, which is, um, does, does, your, does your research require genetic testing of the core blood units? So I'm sure as you can appreciate, we have to ensure the identity of the donor cannot be determined. So depending on the nature, if the answer is yes, depending on the nature of your genetic testing, your application could be denied. If the answer is no, um, then just please provide some, a little justification and maybe perhaps list some of the testing that will be performed. And yes, if the answer is yes, please be as descriptive as possible so that we can accurately assess whether or not the identity of the donor could be determined. So the quick specs on, on our core blood units that we would, just, we would be able to provide to the research committee. So uh, fresh units are collected in our collection bags and they contain 21 mils of anticoagulant. We like the core blood units as a criteria to be greater than 60 mils and have a total nucleated cell count greater than 0.3 times 10 to the 9. This will help ensure that it's relevant and, and uh, that's just relevant for your research project, and there's enough there tangibly to work with. These, the core blood unit is stored and shipped at room temperature, and you will receive it within 48 hours of collection. And what will accompany the application, sorry, the unit is uh, a certificate that states the date and time of collection, as well as the baby's gender. For the frozen unit, uh, it undergoes a little bit more processing, and so it's actually been just takes a buffy coat that's enriched through centrifugation. So the volume that you obtain is about 25 mLs. It's been cryopreserved in 10% DMSO, 1% dextran, and it's, will, it's been stored at liquid nitrogen, so it'll likely be shipped to you in a dry shipper or perhaps even dry ice. And the test results that uh, accompany that are the total nucleate counts, the total C34, and the colony form units, as well as the viability. Quickly, uh, looking more about this, the, the specs for the frozen units, uh, we currently have about 157 available for research, uh, but if the demand surpasses what we have, uh, we will obviously revisit and see if we can acquire more um, for the research community. The, on average, you get a TNC about 13.2, as well as great viability and, and um, 
an average total, uh, total C34 about 2.8, about 2.9 cents per meter. So what will this cost you? Well, it's uh, very affordable. So if, especially if you're an academic or not-for-profit affiliated uh, academic, um, it, it'll cost you about $100, not including shipping and handling for a fresh unit. Uh, if you're a private industry, it's about 300. And for frozen units, again, because it does undergo more uh, processing, it's about 500 and 3,000 if you're uh, from a private industry, affiliated with a private industry. Once approved, and we are distributing units to you, uh, we will put so in the application. There's a section for lay summary, and we'll take that lay summary and put it on our website. And this this is used so that um, it gives the, the the rest of the research community ideas of, of the types of research that are affiliated and that utilize the Corbel units. But it's also primarily used for the general public, especially the Corbel mothers that are thinking about donating and they are interested in taking the box to allow their unit to be used for research if it is if it is deemed unbankable they get a sense of the types of research that utilize these corporate units and so we ask that when you do populate that lay summary within the application to please be as generalized as possible keeping in mind that this these will be used on the website for the general public um, so again just a few stats here um, when we the bank, when our doors first opened for collection for four sites, the collection process was 24 7. But uh, as of 2017, 2018, changed our collection model, and now it's we collect five days a week from 7 to 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. And so you can see there is a dip. Uh, this is a graph looking at the research, the core blood units that are available for research versus those that are distributed to the research community. But even with that change in collection structure, we still are always able to meet the demand. And this is something that we closely monitor. And if we start to see that we aren't able to meet the demand, uh, we will uh, ramp up our, our, uh, our, our collections and, and the units that could be available for research so that we are able to meet the demand. Uh, and you can see also of note when I mentioned that the other three collection sites, excluding Ottawa, because they've always been able, to, the mothers have always been able to donate for research. Uh, once they became on board, uh, a lot of their units that we collected from there have been avail made available to the research community through this program, and you can see uh, that's been increased as well. When you compare uh, 2019, 20, 2019, 2020 to 2018, 2019. This just gives an idea of the, the location of those researchers that are uh, acquiring these core blood units. Uh, and a lot of them, they, they, uh, their projects sort of align with the development of cellular therapies, generally speaking. Uh, some of them are aimed to improve the core blood banking practices, and, and some of them actually align with uh, the transfusion or transplantation practices. And so I mentioned that there's a, a scoring system within the initial review process. This is sort of, sort of the criteria where if, if your project sort of aligned with improving core blood banking practices, it, it may... Um, be rated a little bit higher than say ones that uh, more broadly speaking will develop uh, cellular or improve cellular therapy practices. But that's not to say it's still not of, of importance, it certainly is, uh, but if uh, it just sort of helps play into our distribution algorithm when units are made available. Um, of course, you can see here the majority of which the researchers are affiliated with are within Ontario, some in Quebec, uh, sorry, some in BC and, and some in Alberta, but we are hoping to to uh, expand that and, and be able to serve on a national level uh, the other research labs sort of outside of those provinces and, and within the other provinces, with the exception of Hema, uh, with the exception sorry of Quebec, they are within their own jurisdiction and uh, which is sort of managed by uh, Hema Quebec, and so they have their own research program. Um, so this again just sort of talks about um, the importance of obtaining core blood. Uh, this is done through through our email system, and uh, what's important here is that you are affiliated with a research institute. One of the criteria for getting approval is that uh, you have your institutional REB approval, and so what has to accompany our application, and this is listed in, or all listed or well laid out in the website, 
is your, R your institutional REB application as well as proof of that it's been approved. Um, so, like I mentioned before, um, and, and what you can see in sort of the, the in environmental trends when it relates to core blood is uh, the usage is, is not as high as sort of the other three main avenues to provide stem cells to potential patients. And so, uh, along with this line of thinking, as well as in order to be consistent uh, with Canadian Blood Services vision and mandate, which is to help every patient and match every need, um, the Core Blood Bank can now provide core blood units within our bank for clinical trials. What is the criteria? Um, it's slightly different than it would be if, if obviously you're applying for the Core Blood for Research program. Um, firstly, you uh, have to have permission from your regulatory body, whether that's Health Canada, FDA, what have you. You also have to have, if applicable, uh, institutional REB approval. And um, the method for which you want to utilize our core blood for your clinical trial has to be in accordance with Canadian Blood Services um, Health Canada registration. And that is to say that it's um, core blood has to be used for transplantation purposes. What is the cost? Um, well, we're happy to, 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 to provide or, or to let you know that if you are a Canadian sponsor, clinician, researcher, the cost is zero. There is no cost. If you are a Quebec sponsor, um, because you are outside of our jurisdiction, there is a cost um, that sort of roughly uh, around $3,000. And if you're an international sponsor, uh, the price will align sort of a little bit more broadly with organizational policies, which right now would be roughly around uh, $50,000. And of course, all these prices are ex uh, excluded to be handling. What is the review process? Uh, initially, what we recommend is to contact either myself or our director, Heidi, or any other designate. Um, you can also even reach out through the Core Blood Research uh, email address, and from there, we can, we'll, we'll funnel it through and, and get that email in contact with the right people. Um, and please, in that email, be as descriptive as possible. Let us know exactly what you, what you would like to utilize these Core Blood units for, provide any documentation to support your clinical trial. And from there, it'll be an internal business review uh, within the stem cells program to assess whether or not this is in line with, with our mandate and, and what we hope to accomplish with this new initiative. Likely, there'll be an initial teleconference uh, where we will address any questions, uh, develop a, a collaboration, and, and uh, have some introductions there. At that point, uh, if we're happy to proceed, it'll have to go through what's known as the Cellular Therapy Advisory Committee Review. This is a, a committee that sort of oversees and, and gives permission for a lot of these major initiatives that will take place at CBS. This committee consists of our CEO, Graham, uh, Vice President of Medical Affairs Innovation, as well as our Vice President, President of Quality and Regulatory Affairs, and it also consists of several senior advisors and directors. Um, provided likely there will be some questions and there will be a lot of liaising back and forth then with the sponsor to get those clarified, but provided they give the green light, it then goes over to legal and regulatory for review and execution uh, of certain agreements. So uh, just to wrap things up, uh, just quickly here. So in summary, um, the core blood for research program supports the distribution of non-bankable core blood units to the research, research community uh, to support their research. The process and procedures meet uh, the legal and ethical requirements, so that's obviously of importance. Um, the review process can take uh, two to three months, so please keep that in mind if you are a researcher seeking to acquire these units. Uh, but like I mentioned it previously, we are in the process of trying to streamline that and shorten that time frame. And a lot of that will, will um, in hopes that that will sort of decrease it so that it's between a month or, or two months time to from initial application through to us being able to distribute your, your units. Uh, as I mentioned, we offer both fresh and frozen cords, and uh, obviously the prices will vary depending on the type of, of core blood unit that you're requesting. And just talking about the core blood for clinical trials. Um, so 
again, the criteria there is that it has to be approved by a regulatory body, by a regulatory body, or and or by the uh, your institutional REB. Sorry, not and or, just and, if applicable. If you're affiliated with a private industry, that may not be applicable. Uh, you have to be in accordance with uh, CBS's uh, Health Canada registration. And uh, we're happy to, do, to report that it's a zero cost to Canadian sponsors. And the review process involves uh, both the stem cell program, internal business review, cellular therapy advisory committee review, and of course, legal and regulatory as well. So with that, uh, I conclude my talk. So thanks again for everyone for, for taking the time to, to, to listen, and especially during your lunch hour, and uh, happy to address any questions you might have. Great, Jason, thanks so much for sharing that talk with us. Um, if anyone has any questions, there's a chat box at the side. We were using it at the beginning. So feel free to write your questions there and I can ask them. Um, but yes, I, I would just, I really like the idea of having a lay summary and um, having that posted on the website so that people who are going to deliver, uh, I mean, who are gonna donate their cord blood can see that. I, I just think that's really interesting. Um, and I was wondering with the, uh, you mentioned the costs don't include shipping. Uh, is there a certain company that you use to uh, ensure that the blood is shipped at the correct temperature or does that change depending on the person that you're delivering the units to? Uh, yeah, thanks for that question. Um, it, does, it does change depending on, on the location of the research. So right now, if it's within Ontario, we predominantly use FedEx to deliver the portable unit. If it extends outside of the province, uh, I believe we use World Courier. Um, yep. But I could be mistaken on that. It, it still might be FedEx. But it's one of the two. And actually, I think we're in the process of undertaking a, uh, I can't remember the exact term for it, but to assess whether or not it, it will be uh, those those service providers going forward, it, it may be different depending on the, uh, the how they score um, in in the procurement process. Sure, interesting. And um, are you going? Uh, were you at all involved in the accreditation process and in becoming accredited by FACT? Uh, and could you tell us that how that went? If you were. Uh, I would say, fortunately, I wasn't involved uh, with that process from what I can tell and, and seeing my colleagues after they would go through an audit process or trying to get all the documentation in, in place, it was quite a labor intensive process. Um, yeah. But that's really handled by the, our quality department. And so uh, I don't really have that much visibility to it, just, just really an announcement saying that we've, we, we've acquired, um, for example, in this case, when I was here, uh, the net the net cord uh, fact accreditation. Okay. Uh, but I can't really give you much uh, much detail besides that, unfortunately. That's all right. Thanks for that. And uh, so you had the the email address on the website. If people are able to are interested in in using the cord blood, if they're having any difficulty accessing it through those routes, should they be emailing you directly or emailing that other uh, email that you posted, which I think we can probably share. Research yeah. blood at blood.ca. If, if they're having difficulties, they can feel free to reach out to me directly. And I'd be happy okay. to facilitate and make sure that we are able to uh, get that researcher on board and, and, and distribute. Great. Um, thanks. Uh, so we have a question from Craig. He says, there's a noticeable drop in available cord blood units after Q3 of 2017 and 2018. Uh, do you know any of the factors that might have influenced that? Yeah, we, we do. We do. Um, and so prior to that date or that year, um, at the four collection sites, the, the collection times was 24-7. And then after that right. time period, uh, strategically, we, we sort of brought that back a little bit, and it was five days a week from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. And so because of that, uh, a lot of those, the, the amount of, of units that were potentially available for research uh, dropped, although 
again, still happy to report, and this is something that we closely monitor, we are still able to meet the demand, which ultimately is, is what counts. Yeah, great. And, uh, oh yes, yeah. so have, do you know, or can you share if any of the uh, units have been able to be used in clinical trials to date? Um, no. Or is this just a new program? It's a new program, and so we do have uh, one uh, potential sponsor that's interested, and we're sort of going through the process, uh, the legal the legal agreements uh, to sort of get that in place, but uh, hopefully we'll get that up and running and, and be able to make an announcement uh, at either the end of, likely not until maybe Q1 of uh, this fiscal. Okay, great. Um, any other questions from those listening online? Uh, I had uh, just one quick other one. Um, do you know when it, it changed from being primarily uh, like collected from bone marrow to peripheral? Hmm. It, I wouldn't, yeah, that's a good question. I would, I don't actually know off the top of my head. I would speculate that um, with with the uh, approval of, I think it's a drug called Neupogen or, or okay. some object like that. Once that became approved and it, it, it showed its efficacy and safety, um, it just it, it just became a lot easier because you, you treat the patient, I think it's five days prior to wanting to collect their stem cells with that drug. Uh, I think it's every day leading up to to the collection. And it just it overstimulates the production of not only the, the hemo, hematopoietic stem cells, but the other stem cells as well that would be produced in the bone marrow or other right. cells in general. Producing the bone marrow, they spill out into the blood. And it just makes it easier to collect them from the via leukophoresis. It's less in, less of an invasive uh, process. Yeah, that sounds a lot less invasive and a lot more feasible as someone who might want to donate. Yeah. Um, okay, so if there's no other questions, I'll wrap it up. I just want to encourage everyone to fill out the survey on this webinar. I've just sent out the link again. And I wanted to mention that CellCan is looking at going in a different direction in the future. So we're, we actually have three job positions open right now. You can check them out on our website. Uh, we're moving more towards training so that people can be, uh, we can get as many cell and gene therapy manufacturing sites in Canada as possible. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining in. Uh, Jason, do you have any last things to say? Uh, no, just thanks again for your time and opportunity here. Great. Um, so yeah, fill out our survey and join our future webinars, and we'll see you later. <laughs>